argon is it's okay for for like let us to 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 release the, yeah, the recording yes. to the public. Okay, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Thank you. Um yes, uh can you see the screen here I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Harry, for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to uh, discuss the quantum uh, compilation and also through and also like the awareness in these compilation stages. So I awareness that's uh, what I mean is like um, you may have like some basic assumptions of your quantum compiler. And you're, there's a lot of like realistic problems that you need to be aware of when you are actually doing the uh, compilation. And by introducing those awareness, like one example is like the noise awareness. Like uh, when you are considering like the real device noises, then that makes your compilation design more um, complex. And also like, uh, but that, uh, but you can, uh, with the noise awareness that makes your um, you may compile some like the results that are resilient to noise. Um, so first, let's start with like um, uh, background. Like, what are the what is the job of a quantum compiler? So, given a quantum program, like a high level description of the quantum program, a quantum compiler will compile this uh this uh program to the like the basic operations like the native operations like the control uh signals uh of the target device so there also involves like the circuit optimizations and like a lot of different steps in this compilation um so and why this uh compilation uh, why the quantum compiler is important so especially we are currently in the noise intermediate scale quantum era where we only have limited connectivity. Um, so if, as shown here in this figure, a lot of these qubits are sparsely connected. So if we have this limited um, connectivity and if you're running, if you're designing your problem with, um, uh, which is like um, topology agnostic, then you need these like qubit mapping approaches to map your pro uh, problem to this target hardware. And so that's where you need a quantum compiler to do this automatic qubit mapping and routing for you. Um, and also uh, the quantum operations are typically uh, are noisy and that's where we need these compiler optimizations and error mitigation techniques. So the compiler optimizations, they typically reduce the number of basic, uh, the noisy operations to reduce the level of, level of noise in your circuit. And there's also like error mitigation techniques that you can use to mitigate the noise um, in your circuit. And they can be done at the software level, which handled by these quantum compilers. And here we have some uh, examples of like the base, uh, like the quantum operations, uh, like the readout, there's errors in readout, there's single and two qubit gate errors, and there's also like uh, crosstalk errors. So there's like a lot of different error sources and like there's different ways of handling them. Um, so here let's uh, go through like um, the quantum, a simplified version of the quantum compilation flow. So it's really very hard to directly solve for your input quantum pro problem, compile that down to the control pulses that controls your target hardware. So the existing approach, uh, the like the industry standardized uh, compilers or like such as um, TKIT and like uh, KISKIT, um, CERC, they all have like uh, several abstracted, uh, abstracted steps and if you cannot directly solve for that, you, you need to have several steps to do this whole compilation. And here I show the four steps, which are simplified. And in a real case, it could be like more complicated. For example, you may have like the circuit optimization, first do some optimization, uh, then you do some decomposition mapping, and then you do optimization again. So this is just a simplified version. And uh, we can, 
uh, dive into the details of each stage and see what they are actually uh, what they are actually doing. So, given this input quantum program, the first step is that the compiler will decompose the uh, all the gates to the basis gate sets. Here, one example is like we have the top leg gate, but it is not uh, supported by your target hardware. So you will run, uh, so you will run this decomposition that decomposes this top leg gate to the native uh, to the basic gates, including like CNOS and like the single qubit rotations. So that's the step of uh, gates decomposition. And after you decompose the gates to this basis gates, and uh, these circuits still cannot be directly executed on the hardware because. Um, you'll have the uh, topology limitation. So we have this uh, qubit mapping and routing algorithm to change the circuit layout. Um, for example, here we have a target um, device, this Q0, Q1, and Q2, and these three qubits are linearly connected. And imagine that we have a quantum circuit with like two CNOTs, like the um, one CNOT between zero and one, and that's directly executable because there is like a link between this zero and one. But for the CNOT between Q0 and Q2, it's not directly executable. So in this case, you need to run like the qubit routing algorithm that inserts like one extra swap operations to change the topology or like layout of your quantum circuit. And after inserting this swap, you can see like now this circuit is direct is compatible with the device layout. Um, and after this qubit mapping and routing, the circuit is compatible and also like the uh, the back gates are like the basic gates, but there are still like a step of like optimizations that we can do. Here we show like a very simple example, like we have a sequence of the single qubit operations. And we can just substitute this sequence of gates with a uh, single X gate because they have the same uh, unitary representation. And um, after, and there's like different circuit uh, optimization approaches, including like some people or like the template based optimizations. And also there's like, for example, commutativity detection or like the and like ZS calculus, this graphical based uh, optimizations. And uh, there's also like rethinesis, which means like you convert your uh, your gates to back to the unitary and directly implement directly find gates that uh, finding the smallest sequence of gates that implements the target unitary, and that is called like rethinesis of your circuit. And after this circuit optimizations, we're still like so far we're still at like the gates level. But we need to like convert those uh, gates to the actual uh, control pulses uh, to the target um, hardware. And there's like a gates scheduling policies and also like the ways to convert your gates to the pulses. So one example, like in the current um, IBM's QSKit framework, um, these pulses are like the pre-calibrated pulses. So once you create, once you generate your um, gates with uh, once you compile uh, to the last step and you have like all the gates are like the C naught and like the uh, square root of X rotations or like the X gates, then it's basically the QSK compiler will use like a lookup table to load. For example, I have a C naught between a particular pair of qubits. Then I would just use that the pre-calibrated uh, post sequence to implement that C naught and like assemble these uh, post sequence together to generate like the final post scheduler. And so this is like after this four steps, we can uh, we can we com we compile this quantum program to the final control pulses. And uh, this is actually like uh, simplified and like at each step you are taking some simplification. So actually we can introduce some awareness in this compilation flow. And one example is that, uh, for example, if we consider more of like realistic problems, we're considering the noise aware case. 
like we're introducing, uh, we are aware that these gates of uh, these gates are noisy, and also like noise uh, gates on different qubits have like different uh, error rates, or like there's pres uh, there exists in some specific types of uh, error sources. So the, for each step, for example, we can have some noise aware compilation uh, approaches. Uh, one, for example, at the gates decomposition, there's uh, the single qubits uh, noise aware decomposition. Um, uh, which means like if you are aware of like the T1 and T2 gate error rates in your system, then you can uh, decompose your single qubit gate accordingly to mitigate some part, some of noise. And there's also another work on equivalent circuit averaging, meaning that instead of just decomposing to one circuit and measure that, I can decompose these gates into different equivalent circuits. And I just measure and take, for example, taking the average, and uh, hopefully that will like cancel a lot of like the biased, uh, a lot of those biased errors. And um, in the second step of like the qubit mapping and routing, there's also like, uh, for example, we can introduce like noise awareness. And there's a couple of papers on these, no these are called like noise aware qubit mapping and routing algorithms. So the basic idea is that when you're doing mapping and routing, you are aware of like which qubits are good and which are qubits are bad based on calibration data. And also you're aware of like which couplings are good and which are bad. So based on this information, you're trying to, when you're doing this mapping and routing, you're selecting the good qubits and also like good couplings. And uh, then in the third step, there's like uh, for the circuit optimizations, for example, when you're doing some retinesis, you may uh, be aware of the error rates of this the circuit that you are thinnesis and trying to thinnesize the circuit with least gates errors. And there's actually there's also some things that um, without this noise aware, what we want is like reducing the gates, uh, reducing the gate count. Um, but there are some er but there are some uh, noise aware um, like error mitigation approaches. I just put them in this. Uh, they're not exactly the circuit optimization, but they're kind of contradictory with the uh, circuit optimization, uh, which uh, we've reduced the gate, but there are approaches, for example, like a dynamic decoupling, where we introduce extra single qubit gates in these, uh, for these idling qubits to, uh, to fight, fight against like the error, uh, to fight against these idling, uh, idling errors. And uh, then at the last, at the for the gates and the pulse scheduling, um, there's like, a, a, for example, there's like a noise aware, like the crosstalk adaptive scheduling. Like once these um, qubits are, um, for example, there's crosstalk between those like qubit pairs. Uh, if you're executing uh, qubit, uh, two qubit operations in parallel between se uh, several, uh, qubit pairs, then you may have like very high crosstalk. Then one way to uh, reduce, to mitigate this crosstalk is that you have a different scheduling policy. Whenever there is like the uh, parallel gates between these like uh, regions with high crosstalk, you're changing these uh, gates to, uh, instead of parallel executing them, you're changing them to sequential. And there's also like the frequency aware compilation um, approaches that uh, Goes against these um, crosstalk uh, crosstalk errors. So by being aware of noise, there's like a lot of things to uh, include in like at each step of the compilation, and there's like a lot of um, a lot of works that focuses on each iteration. That uh, for example, for decomposition, I'm trying to minimize the gate count at the decomposition step. And for qubit mapping, I'm having a paper that's trying to minimize the routing. And also like I'm having something that's maximized like the circuit optimizations. So a lot of those previous works are treating these um, steps, uh, they're solving for one step of the problem. Um, but um, solving for these problems like locally may not actually grant you like the uh, globally optimal solution because we are having like this optimization flow. So it's actually better to have some cross-stage awareness. So that's what I am going to, that's like the covers, uh, the topics that I'm planning to cover in this uh, presentation. So 
instead of focusing on one step, for example, in, for the decomposition step, um, instead of just trying to minimize finding a template that minimizes the gate count, we can actually be aware of the circuit optimizations, um, meaning that um, when because different decompositions may have like different circuit optimization opportunities. And once you decompose your gates, you lose this a lot of like the uh, circuit, uh, a lot of like the gate informations. So it's better when you decompose the gates, you're also aware of like what are the subsequent circuits optimizations and your you try to make, maximize these optimization opportunities at your decomposition step. Um, so this is like uh, one uh, one section that I'm going to cover. And another uh, topic, uh, is another cross-stage awareness is between this qubit mapping and routing step with the circuits optimizations. So uh, we have a paper called not all swaps have the same cost. So basically a lot of these mapping and routing algorithms, they are trying to minimize the swap at, they're simplifying the problem and trying to minimize the swap operations at your mapping and routing stage. But actually these swaps may be optimized by the subsequent circuit optimizations. So these swaps can, should not be considered as the same cost. Sometimes you can even implement a swap operation for free because of these uh, optimizations. So by bringing in these, these circuit optimizations uh, awareness to the mapping and like the decomposition stage, we can have like a better, um, we can have a better compiler and also uh, with, very, uh, with very slight overhead. So first I will um, cover this paper, the context aware decomposition for the quantum gates. Um, so this is in collaboration with the uh, uh, collaborators from Rice and University and U Chicago, and also uh, from SuperTech. And uh, this will appear at this ISCAS conference. Um, so what we mean by this context aware decomposition? Here we use the top legate as an example. Uh, for the top legate, we may be very familiar with the canonical six C naught decomposition for the fully connected systems. So for this top legate, uh, we may decompose that to the six uh, to this six uh, to the uh, to the circuit with six C naughts. And one example is that a uh, very simple example is this: like the top lead does not exist solely in the system. There's always like skates before and after that. So a very simple example: if the circuit contains another C naught, and we're using like the same decomposition template, then actually the transpile circuit contains um, seven C naughts, and there is like um, not much circuit optimization opportunity with your uh, within this uh, the circuit that you decomposed. And an alternative approach is that uh, actually we're aware that the topo uh, the topology gate is a self inverse. So uh, since it's a self inverse, if we just inverse all the gates in this decomposition in an inverse order, uh, it also implements a Toffley gate. So this is another valid decomposition of the Toffley gate. But um, we may notice that the circuit structure has changed. And if we're using like a different, uh, this different decomposition, and uh, we use that, uh, you use this decomposition uh, in the circuit and um, um, th actually the first two knots, they can be canceled. And the circuit now only contains like five C knots, and um, it's kind of equivalent to like you have like a four C knot top legate decomposition. Um, so the idea is that when we decompose, uh, although a lot of the, although we are trying to minimize the number of gates in your decomposition, but there's also some variance that you can have in your uh, decomposition templates. And, um, so in the quantum compilation flow, the gate decomposition is usually followed by some circuit optimizations. 
and uh, a stick conversation might have many variants. And here the variants mean uh, uh, the definition is that there are decompositions with similar gate count but different uh, structures. And since there are like many uh, gate variants, and a lot of these variants are like based on the circuit equivalence rules, so we should actually decompose the quantum gates based on its context. Uh, here, the context meaning like the gates surrounding it, or formally definition is that the predecessors and the successors of that gate operation in the circuit uh, directed a cyclic graph representation. Um, so on the bottom here, we have like uh, three unitaries and like this U1 has like different uh, context, like the its predecessor U0 are like in different uh, are between like different uh, pairs of qubits. So actually we should decompose this U1 uh, differently according to where this U0 and U2, like the predecessor, the location of these predecessors and successors. Um, so how do we generate these variants? So first we study like the uh, basis gate level decomposition, meaning that decomposing this uh, the top layer gates to the like the uh, the basic basis gates in the like assembly language. Uh, for example, in open quasum, it's like the C naught and like the U uh, three gates. So we may have like different strategies. For example, first as we mentioned, like top layer is a self inverse gate, and there's also like uh, approach. Uh, there's also uh, uh, there's also strategies like permuting the control qubits with another control or like permuting the control with a target qubit. Um, here we show the example of like you just permuting the control qubit and that does not change the circuit functionality but it actually changes the circuit structure and like they will be suitable for different um, circuit contexts. And the third strategy is actually rethink this. So based on circuit equivalence rules, you may change the circuit structure but um, there are some circuit structures that you can never create with, uh, with these uh, equivalence rules. So if you wanted, for example, some specific structures, um, for example, here, uh, based on equivalence rules, you cannot create the template that has like CNOS between zero and one that may cancel with the predecessor and also between zero and one that may cancel with the successor. So in that case, if you want to create a template with that specific uh, structure, then you need some uh, rethinesis approaches to fix your circuit structure and try to find the good implementation. And luckily for this top layer, we have, uh, based on rethinesis, we have find like all the possible, uh, we have di find different uh, uh, templates for like all the possible locations, combinations for your predecessors and like the successor positions. And then like for the, for this, uh, IBM devices, there's actually like another level of decomposition, which is like the native gate level decomposition. So uh, it's act so actually these CNOS, although they are like the basis case in your open quasum, but they are not the real gates that are implemented on the hardware. So they are actually, the CNOT is further decomposed to like the cross resonance gates and then like some single qubit rotations. So cross resonance is what we actually implement on the target hardware. And um, there are like, also like we have some different strategies like uh, CNOT is also self inverse. And uh, there's a way, uh, there's an in interesting technique called polarity switch. So for the cross resonance gates, uh, for the ac actual implementation um, on these superconducting devices, you are not having like a whole cross resonance, but it's actually implemented by like a positive half cross resonance, a, a, a X, uh, an X gate, and then a negative uh, half cross resonance. So this positive and negative half cross resonance sequence, they um, serve as some, like the, it's more resilient uh, to noise. And the par polarity, so on the bottom, uh, on the bottom left, we have like this canonical C0 decomposition to the cross resonance with the first, the positive uh, cross, half cross resonance followed by the negative. But if we are switching the order of these cr half cross resonance, if we're implementing first the negative half cross resonance and then the positive half, 
we still have this nice um, error mitigation uh, property, uh, but we have some side effect of changing the position of your single qubit gates. So now in, uh, with a canonical decomposition, your single qubit gates were on, like on one side, but with this polarity switch, you are actually changed, moving one of, it's like more like a diagonalized version. So based on these strategies, like you can actually create the different variants of your C naught decomposition, and you may up and you may uh, maximize your choosing the best decomposition that according to like the single qubit gates around that to maximize the single qubit gates uh, to reduce the number of single qubit gates. So these are like the two examples of the gate decompositions that are aware of these, um, uh, that are aware of the context. Or in other words, you can also uh, think of that like it's an optimization aware decomposition approach because being aware of context is like you want to maximize some uh, gates uh, optimization opportunities. So these are like some discussions in this uh, gate decomposition, which is aware of this context or like optimizations. And the another topic that I would like to cover is this uh, is like combine uh, is like making this routing step more uh, optimization, uh, making the uh, routing step optimization aware. So the title is like not all swaps have the same cost, the case for optimization aware qubit routing. So this is the work I did as my uh, PhD study and uh, this appears at, on this uh, last year's HPCA conference. Um, so uh, let's first just uh, try to recap like the qubit mapping and routing step. So qubit map mapping and routing means that laying out a logical circuit onto a physical device with some limited connectivity with these qubits. And it is actually like an NP-hard problem. Um, so it's pretty hard to solve. And typically these uh, mapping and routing are like separated like to two steps. The first step is like mapping, which means uh, I have some logical qubits and I want to know which are the physical qubits that I want to that I want to implement, uh, that I want to map to. So that's like logical to physical qubit mapping. And then we have the routing, um, which means like uh, we're applying the swap operations to move some qubits to the physically connected qubits. Um, so with this two steps, you may solve this uh, qubit mapping and routing problem. And there's like different heuristics uh, and, and there's like different approaches for example, uh, there are heuristics, uh, for example, like Saber's algorithm, which is like QSK's default routing algorithms, and also like the routing algorithm in Ticket. And these heuristics are, uh, they can be uh, compiled really fast, but uh, they have like just decent, decent quality. And um, there's also like optimal mappers um, where these mappers converts these, um, uh, converts these uh, the qubit mapping and routing problem to some uh, existing problems, for example, like the set is a three set problem or like this uh, binary integer programming problem, and then using like the classical solvers to solve for like a, finding like an op optimal solution for this uh, for the um, for the mapping and routing. Um, but the limitation for these types of approaches is that they have like limited scalability. Uh, where like the number of C naught is limited because you may have like an exponential increase in terms of your uh, compilation time. So like the size of your uh, circuit, the number of qubits, they are small, but uh, it can generate like optimal, uh, either optimal number of swaps or like optimal, num uh, optimal depths of your circuit. So these are some previous works and a lot of these previous works are at this routing step they are focusing on like, I'm trying to minimize the swap operations. Um, but uh, one observation or like the motivation is that actually these, uh, like they were considered like independent. So here we have like two examples of the uh, swap gates insertion. So we have like an original circuit and imagine we're mapping that to a linearly connected device. So um, this the last C naught, uh, the last gate, like this control U three gate, is not 
it cannot be implemented uh, directly mapped to the device. So you need to insert swap gates. And there's actually like two options of like inserting the swap operations. You may swap between Q1 and Q2, or you may swap between like Q0 and Q1. And if you're taking too much abstractions in your uh, routing and mapping algorithms, you're only considering the swap operations, then you're very likely to treat these two equally because they have the same swap gate count. And there are some of, uh, some of the existing works, they, for these cases with the same swap gate counts, they're just picking, like randomly picking between them. But actually there's like gate optimizations after your routing. So, so eventually what you have is like, uh, if you are inserting between one and two and after this uh, optimizations, you, there's no optimization opportunity and it's resulting in like three extra CNOTs. But if you're mapping that, uh, if you're inserting the swap between like zero and one, there's actually optimization opportunities and resulting in like one extra C not gate count. So that means like when you're taking the subsequent optimizations into consideration at your routing step, you may, cho you may choose like a better, uh, better routing. And uh, another, some observation to motivate that is like in the circuit generated by these quantum compilers, a large proportion of these swap gates are actually optimized by the subsequent optimization passes. Where we did some analysis, like when we map this Grover to this 2D grid topology and 20% of them are optimized by the pass called two qubit block rethinesis and 40% of them are optimized by gate cancellation. So that means a lot of like in summary, like 60% of them are being optimized. So you definitely need to consider that in your routing step. And our solution is that we develop like a optimization aware qubit routing algorithm, NASC, which is like not all swaps have the same cost. And the algorithm calculates the actual C0 gate count for each route and selects the best route. So when you're doing the mapping, the act estimates the optimization opportunities and returns like the uh, what is the actual C0 cost for implementing the route. And we also introduce like the optimization of where it gates the swap gates insertion to facilitate some subsequent optimizations. So for example, it's actually quite, um, you can uh, you can also can view that uh, based on the previous discussion, you can also view this as like the uh, optimization aware or like the context aware um, swap, swap gate decomposition because your swap gate can be decomposed in like different ways. There's like two different ways, whether you have like this two controls on one qubit and one control on the other one, or you have like the flipped version. And if you are just doing the decomposition early and um, then you're doing some optimization, then you're actually losing the information that, okay, this chunk of gates is a swap and um, you may not identify some optimization opportunities. So it's better to just, so it's better to detect them earlier um, as you do the decomposition before you lose these nice properties of some uh, of some of your quantum operations. So um, these are like the with mapping routing and also like the gate decompositions. So let's uh, get back to this quantum compilation flow. So we are associating this decomposition. We've been discussing like decomposition, the mapping and routing, and also the circuit compilations. And uh, so one question is like, if you're solving them, as we noticed in the previous discussions, as since you are having these like abstracted steps and you are solving them independently or having some sort of awareness, um, you are still, you still cannot really having like a very optimized solution because you are still having like limited awareness of what is going on with the other steps. So can we just solve like, the decomposition mapping and circuit optimization, just trying to put them in one step and like finding like a more of like a globally optimized uh, solution. And uh, there's actually techniques for that. And the technique, so then I'm going to introduce like the last work um, is the tackling the qubit mapping problem with permutation aware thinnesses. So especially the, the so the, the approach called thinnesses, unitary thinnesses, will be exactly what we want for doing a lot of, it's kind of like combining a multiple steps past altogether. So what do we mean by circuit thinnesses? It means that uh, given a unitary representation of your circuit, you can thinnesize your, generate your 
gates based on like your gate set, um, uh, like finding the best implementation of your gates uh, based on uh, uh, finding the best implementation sequence of gates based on your input um, circuit, uh, your input unitary. And uh, so this work has been collaborated with like the Biscuit team. So there's, they have like a, a lot of, uh, so, so basically there's like a toolkit for quantum circuit synthesis. And they have like a several, a lot of publications in this direction. For example, there's like the QSearch algorithm that's synthesizing this uh, unitaries with optimum DAS up to four qubits. And also there's like fast uh, synthesis algorithms that's uh, scale, more scalable that synthesis up to like eight qubits. I think there's like more advanced uh, approaches that is beyond these like eight qubits. And also there's like approaches that you use this resynthesis as an optimization approach um, by it's like an op, so this QGO is an optimizing compiler that combines this partitioning and synthesis. So given a large circuit, you may find some regions of your circuit and taking these regions to like resynthesize these circuits and reduce your circuit cost. And the last um, work is the quest uh, is the Quest um, uh, paper, where it's like scalable circuits approximations. So instead of like synthesizing the exact unitary, you may actually synthesize an approximation of your target unitary. And that may require like a lot, uh, that may significantly reduce the number of CNOTS gates, um, uh, the number of basic operations in your circuit. So as long as you set up like a error tolerated threshold, and um, you can actually use some approximate thinnesses to reduce your circuit size. And also like reducing the circuit size um, because you're reducing the number of gates and act this is actually less noisy on the uh, NISC devices. So sometimes, uh, so like using these approximations, you may have like actually better results than the uh, exact thinnesses and running on the NISC devices. So um, here we are, focusing on like the thinnesses. So thinnesses can be used for optimization and thinnesses itself can be considered like a gate decomposition approach um, because you're thinnesizing a unitary. That means like you're finding a decomposition of that. And um, here we particularly wanted to discuss like thinnesses has the potential for mapping circuits to the target device. Um, here we are talking about a specific class of thinnesses algorithm called permutation aware thinnesses. So here is an example uh, is like this Q search algorithm. So uh, when you have, when you want to map your circuit to a target device and you have some connectivity constraints. So this is like a bottom up thinnesis approach. For example, I know this device is like linearly connected. So I know like the gate between zero and two does not exist. So I will start with like a layer of single qubit operations. And then I will add these blocks of uh, block of circuits on the pairs that are uh, exists on the on, on your device. They are like supported on your device, and I will check uh, the distance between the current unitary and your target unitary. And uh, if it's uh, not very close, then we'll pick the closest one and trying to add like another layer and like doing this like by layer by layer. You can actually synthesize. You can generate the circuit that. Um, uh, that implements your target unitary. And because in the searching process, we are have, we're imposing this uh, hardware topology constraints. We're only building the blocks on the hardware, uh, uh, on the connectivity that are provided by the hardware. So the resulting circuit is actually, can be mapped, directly mapped to your target hardware without any uh, qubit mapping, uh, like swap gate insertion. So here we take an example of like, uh, we look at like the three qubit QFT and we're trying to map that to like a linear architecture. Originally like the QFT is the three qubit QFT is like the six DNAS fully connected design. And this is kind of like the best known implementation because you need like a control rotation between each pair of your QFT, uh, between each pair of your qubit and like three control rotations and after decomposition is like six DNAS. So this is like uh, best known implementations. And if you're mapping this six CNOTS QFT to a target, um, for example, like a linearly connected device, and here we're using like the optimal uh, 
like an optimal router. So it turns out that if you're using like a routing algorithm, you have to insert min at minimally one swap operations to change the topology. Um, but but uh, swap are quite costly and now it increases to like nine CNOTs. And um, comparing with the synthesis where we, regardless of like the circuit structure, regardless of, of uh, forget about like the swap insertion, we just take the unitary and we're trying to find the circuit that can be directly implemented uh, like a bottom up thinicizing. And we can get actually a linearly connected circuit with only um, six C knots, which is like the same count as the original size without introducing any extra uh, routing overhead. So uh, the uniqueness of like the synthesis over these mapping, mapping and routing algorithms is that the mapping algorithms, you're only introducing like extra swap operations. So you're only increasing the circuit size, but you are still preserving the original structure. So that may lead to like a suboptimal solution compared to synthesis where you forget about like the original circuit structure. You are just trying to start from bottom up and you may find a much better circuit structure with um, synthesis and map that to, and, and this circuit is like map, can be mapped to the target hardware. And um, with this synthesis approach, we already have some pretty good results here. Original circuit is six and uh, the resulting circuit uh, mapped circuit is also 16 knots. So it seems like it's pretty good enough. And um, if you are thinicizing the target unit rate, it seems like six is like the lower bound. Um, so we've been thinking of like, can we further reduce the gate count? And the answer is, is yes. So if we cannot, Chain, if for a target unitary, we cannot further reduce the C naught. How about we change the unitary? Uh, we change the unitary that we need for thinnesses, but we still preserve the functionality of the circuit. So that's uh, so here we introduce the concept of permutation aware thinnesses. And um, here I will use a simple diagram to uh, demonstrate the idea of this permutation aware thinnesses. So given a tar uh, an input unitary, the regular thinnesis approach just thinnesize that unitary matrix. And um, differently, when we have, and this requires like three CNOTs in this example. And differently in the permutation of where thinnesis, the first step is that we're introducing a pair of input permutation, this PI and its inverse PI transpose, and also P out the output permutation and this transpose PL transpose. And um, because these are like the pair of operations, they will cancel. So it's equivalent to the original circuit. However, in the next step, instead of thinicizing this block, uh, yellow block, this U, we're actually thinicizing a different block. We're grouping this uh, input permutation with the U and your output permutation. So now we're thinicizing a different unitary, this P out U P in. And by changing this unitary that we need for thinnesis, we can actually, here, we only need two C knots for implementing that, uh, the permuted unitary. So we're saving, uh, so we're saving one C knot in this example. Um, but there is like a remaining question. We still have this, um, this circuit is functionally equivalent to U, but we still have this transpose of like this input permutation and like the inverse of this output permutation, these two blue blocks. And it turns out that for these two blue blocks, since they are simply permutation operations, we don't need any quantum operations to implement these blue blocks. These blue, two blue blocks can be resolved with classical post-processing. And uh, one very simple example is like, uh, for example, for the output permutation. If you are going to permute your qubits zero and one, uh, instead of like adding a swap to do that, what you can do is like, you can just re-index your physical qubits. So instead of like measuring from like qubits, physical qubit zero, one, two, I'm measuring from physical qubit one, zero, two. So this is like just a very simple classical post-processing without, uh, without any quantum operation, but you can implement these input and like the output permutations. So by combining this uh, permutation, by introducing this, of permute input and output permutations to change your unitary and also like uh, resolving them with the classical post-processing, we can reduce the uh, circuit size for thinnesses. 
And uh, here we show the example, similar example for like the QFT3 example, where we use Q search. There's like six CNOTs, and we can notice that we're preserving the qubit order, like Q0, Q1, Q2, and the output is also like 0, 1, 2. But if we introduce like an output permutation, now the output order has been permuted as like 1, 0, 2. And the thinness is now we only require five CNOTs. So that's like one example of like uh, introducing permutations to reduce the size, the size of your circuit. And we have more uh, data, like uh, we have some smaller uh, blocks of circuit and also some just uh, toy benchmarks here. Uh, we, and we're mapping these circuits to linearly connected devices. And we're comparing with like the whole compilation flow of like the mapping, routing, and, and then optimization from QSK, TK, and also like these optimal uh, routers. And um, it, it turns out that simply using thinnesses, you may have like the best uh, results because thinnesses directly, uh, the skew search thinness directly finds the best implementation according to your uh, hardware topology. And then by introducing the permutation aware thinnesses, we may further reduce um, the gate counts, uh, the gate counts, for example, for this gate, we can uh, reduce like one third of the gates. So uh, here's the example of like using permutation where thinnesses for mapping some small circuits. But what about the large circuits? Um, actually, the one problem for this thinnesses approach is the scalability issue. Um, you may encounter some like exponential scaling of your compilation time. So in order to leverage these thinnesses for this qubit mapping, and also solve for like relatively large problems, uh, we introduce this permutation aware mapping uh, framework, which incorporates the thinnesses approaches for smaller blocks with the routing algorithms, uh, heuristic round, routing algorithms that schedules these blocks. So uh, the first uh, technique that I'm going to introduce is like called circuit partition. So uh, considering like we have this four qubit circuit, and we can actually partition this circuit into like the three qubit blocks as shown below. And by partitioning this circuit, we are actually converting a large problem to like these, um, like a large, like the MA exponential scaling, but we are partitioning that into like the smaller uh, blocks that are solvable with the, uh, with the synthesis. So it overcomes the exponential scaling of thinnesses. And we're only like synthesizing these blocks in, in parallel. And um, so by leveraging this circuit partition, the routing heuristics and some, uh, and like the previous discussion of the permutation where thinnesses, uh, we came up with the permutation where mapping uh, framework. So given an input circuit, the first step is like, we are going to partition our circuit into like the smaller blocks with the predefined uh, block size. And in this example, we're limiting the block size to be three. And then we're thinnesizing the permutations for the blocks and also uh, thinnesizing for the possible block architectures because um, in, the, uh, and we're doing this thing in parallel so that can be significantly speed up. And we're thinnesizing for different uh, all, for the possible block architectures because we don't know which block will be mapped to which region. So when you are, it's inefficient to just do that at the mapping process because that means like you you need to do all the permit, uh, all the blocks in sequential. So we just uh, do like this pre-processing in a parallel manner. And after generating these uh, pre uh, pre thinnesized informations, we will use like a heuristic mapping algorithms to map the circuit with a forwarding pass. And we'll select the best block permutations at their pass. And also we will try to, uh, and also we will introduce some swap operations if necessary. So for example, like your block is initially mapped to uh, qubits that are like far away, then simply permuting that is not going to make them closer, but you still need some swap operations to move these physical qubits closer. Um, so uh, we have like a heuristic algorithms to balance the cost of, in, in, uh, of inserting the swaps and also like uh, choosing the block uh, permutations. So 
here's like so this is like the overview of uh, this approach and by introducing the partitioning and this uh, uh, combined combination of permutation uh, combination of synthesis and uh, routing we can actually have a, a scalable approach and also like a pretty high quality so here we will show some evaluation results um, comparing comparing uh, in terms of like the CNOT gate counts so uh, we compare with a lot of like this uh, real uh, like the real world experiment uh, real world um, app, uh, benchmarks and we uh, map them to like the 72 qubit uh, bristcon chip and for the combination of benchmarks we produce circuits shorter by up to 68 percent uh, and at like 18 percent fewer gates on than QSCAD and up to 6, 36 uh, fewer gates than ticket and up to 67 fewer gates than the previous version of biscuit. Um, so uh, as you can see, like uh, Pam um, outperforms all uh, outperforms the other compilers uh, in all but just one corner cases, which is like this QAOA 12. And it turns out that this is actually because um, there are some extra, uh, this is actually because of like the bad initial mapping, because we're still having some heuristic things in the mapping framework uh, when we map the blocks. So that's heuristic is not working very well for this case. And for the other compilers, for example, Qiskit, um, Ticket, and like, they all have some pretty good, uh, they all have some extra checks, for example, some isomorphism checks. And uh, we evaluate, um, so this is like the result we simply use from uh, this PAM framework. And we tested that if we're introducing like the extra uh, checks in this uh, QSKIT, meaning that we're building this thing inside QSKIT, then we can actually reduce this 200 gate count to like 180 uh, what gate count, like which is like the best result. Um, so this is like the CNOT gate count comparison. And we also have some uh, result comparing with like the optimal solver where we can only compare with only with some small uh, with some small benchmarks and um, it turns out that uh, for these different architectures PAM generates like the smallest uh, like gen so we are for a fair comparison we're actually comparing like the optimal layouts algorithms com uh, combined with the optimization uh, or like the full uh, like the maximum set optimizations. And it turns out that directly using, uh, like using PAM generates the best, better uh, results. And also uh, it overcomes because we are partitioning that. So it has actually has better scalability when we are targeting like some uh, uh, like larger, uh, when we're targeting some larger um, problems. And uh, here I would like to show some, uh, so, so here's like a breakdown of the improvements. So comparing like with the heuristic Sabre, uh, if we implement like the block version of Sabre, basically implement based on partitioning, we can get some speed up, uh, we can get some reduction. And then if we're synthesizing these blocks, we can get another layer level of uh, reduction. And then if we're using, not using the regular synthesis, but like the permutation of weird synthesis, here the pre and post PAM is like, we in, in only introduce like the input and out or the output permutation, we get another uh, reduction. And if we combine those, like the pre and post permutations, we get a significant improvement. And there's actual like, there's some extra gates absorption optimizations that you may uh, incorporate to further reduce the gate counts. So like the biggest jump here, uh, so the, in conclusion, the advantage, uh, the improvement comes from like uh, doing block version, uh, like blo uh, doing block level uh, routing and also doing thinnesses and, um, the, and the last, uh, and, and also like doing this, uh, the permutation aware thinnesses. So there's like three factors that contribute to the improvements. And so we would like to note a very interesting uh, a very interesting property, which is like mapping to the fully connected devices, which is very unique for PAM. So um, considering like the existing mapping uh, frameworks, what we are, these all like these mapping, uh, these mapping algorithms, what we did is actually we're mapping a circuit with rich connectivity to a limited connected, to, uh, to a limited uh, connected device. For example, you, you're, your uh, your hardware is 
uh, only linearly connected. That's where you need some of uh, the mapping and routing algorithms to introduce like the extra swaps to change the topology. But considering if it's the other way around, if your original circuit only has limited connectivity, but you want to implement that on a densely connected device, then in this case, for, uh, for example, in an extreme case, it's a fully connected device. Then all the connectivity constraints are satisfied. So you do not need any swapping or like any mapping. Um, you don't need any like mapping algorithms because that can be directly executed. And uh, using these, the mapping, uh, even you, you go through like the mapping process, that's not going to give you any benefits. Uh, so here we take an example of like mapping a linearly, and, and this is like particularly um, useful for like the trap fully connected trapped line devices. So for example, we're mapping a 12 qubit linearly connected QOA to a fully connected trapped line device. So here, this is like the QOA and we got the benchmark from like Supermark and it's originally linearly connected is like 180 CNOTs and very simply using a QSKIT or any other uh, compilers or like mappers. Uh, and also there's, um, you will notice that when we map to the fully connected device, it will, it's still a linearly connected circuit. And because there is like uh, no gate optimization opportunities uh, existing, so um, the circuit remains to be the same and um, the gate count, everything remains to be the same. But if you're using PAM, uh, to map that to a fully connected trap line device. Actually, PAM will convert this circuit to a fully connected circuit and leveraging the actual connectivities provided by our target hardware. And uh, by introducing this permutation, uh, using this permutation where mapping, we're actually generating a fully connected circuit. And by leveraging these extra connections, we can reduce the gate count from 198 to only 127 CNOTs. So this is like a pretty unique property of PAM when you map something to this densely connected devices. And uh, it's quite common when you map something to the fully, uh, to the, this is particularly useful on the trapped iron devices because typically when you write a program, uh, for example, QFT, it might be like um, fully connected, but for a lot of the other benchmarks or for example, the variational algorithms where you have like a UCC SDN set, or like uh, uh, like a lot of the other like or like for example the QOA problems you are not really assume your circuit is really not fully connected so the, you may take advantage of PAM when you're mapping these like the variational algorithms these answers to the uh, fully connected uh, uh, to the fully connected trapped line devices so here we have some comparison. And uh, just uh, in short, we focus on some hard to correct problems. For example, QFT, like none of originally is 20 and none of the other compilers could optimize that. But with PAM, you can reduce that the K down to like uh, 18. So this is like the best known implementation. And also like TFIM and TFIXY. These are like the transverse, uh, TFIM is the transverse field icing model, which is also like very hard to optimize. And you may notice that uh, for the, the other compilers, uh, none of them can, uh, it's always like 4,000 and none of them can actually um, reduce that. But if you're using PAM, introducing the permutation awareness, you can actually significantly reduce the CNOT gate count. Um, so the current implementation of the, is available in biscuits uh, with the optimization level four. So you may try, uh, you may download the code and try it uh, to optimize on, your own circuits and uh, the paper will be our, our archive next week. And um, uh, so that's pretty much the discussion. And uh, thank you all for uh, uh, attending the talk. And I would like to thank my, uh, uh, thank my collaborators and also the acknowledge the, the support from, these, uh, from the HQC project and the QNEX project. And um, thank you. <laughs>